A lot of kids like to play hide and seek, but when adults go missing, that's when they call me and other law enforcement to come do the seeking. Sometimes we catch a break. Sometimes we're not so lucky. You must always be aware of your surroundings. Now, let's say someone broke in and you couldn't get away. Is there a safe place that you could hide? Now tonight's stories about hide and seek gone wrong. Ready or not, here they come. You're about to hear three scary stories read by Don't Turn Around. Let us know in the comments below what type of stories would you like Don't Turn Around to read next week. I love my brother, but he can be a real pain in the butt. I'm 14. My brother is seven. I had this new babysitter called Savannah, who was a freshman in college, and she was so hot. I was embarrassed at first that my mom and dad made me have a babysitter, but they said it was more for my brother than me. Obviously. And having Savannah over was actually really awesome. Savannah and John were playing hide and seek when they asked me if I wanted to play. I didn't really at first, but... She gave me this look that made me think she really wanted me to. So I agreed. John started to count, and Savannah ran off somewhere upstairs. I looked around for a moment, thinking about what to do, then decided I'd go upstairs too. I went into my room and saw the closet door move, so I knew where she was. I was about to dive under the bed, but instead, I... Well, I was a guy, and she was hot, and the lights were off, and it was dark. So, I went into the closet and closed the door. It was cracked open just enough so I could look out and see if John was coming in to look for us. I heard him downstairs still counting out loud, and I nudged myself further into that closet, hoping to press gently up against her. I heard her soft breathing. But she didn't say anything. Of course, I was nervous with her being an older woman and all, but we were in the dark and I dreamed of something like this and seven minutes of heaven. Of course, something like that would never happen to me because I wasn't exactly the popular type. But then I felt her hand on my leg. Now, if you could have seen my face, you would have seen my eyebrows raise in fright. It wasn't horror. It was more shock. A shock that this was actually happening. I felt her hand slowly go up my leg, feel its way onto my back. It started to lift up my shirt from behind. I, I kind of froze. Just feeling her hands around me it was the most amazing thing ever until... I looked towards the bed and saw Savannah hiding below it. Wait, what? I could see Savannah looking out from the bed, waiting for John. As he slowly walked up the stairs, she giggled. And he came in and he saw her. And she crawled out and they left, both searching for me. Now, I wanted to scream out, but I was terrified. The hands were on my back, rubbing me gently. I felt lips now kissing my neck. I remember I started trembling and, and I scrunched my eyes close and I heard footsteps. It was Savannah and John coming back in. John opened the door and they found me. John was so happy, he didn't notice that I had tears running out of my eyes. Savannah picked up on it and asked if I was okay. And as she turned on the light, I made a quick glance to the inside of the closet, the same time lunging away from it. There wasn't anything in there except clothes hanging up. I prodded at them with a metal hanger to make sure, and I checked that there wasn't any type of removable panel in the closet. Savannah thought I was completely crazy. But I know what I felt. For a few weeks, I slept in John's room. I didn't tell mom or dad why. I just said that I wanted to keep John company. After a while, my mom and dad told me I had to move back into my room. I wouldn't. 
So I asked John if he wanted to switch rooms. My room is much bigger, so it wasn't a hard sell. I feel real bad because I do love him. And this morning, he told me he heard a scratching noise come from the closet. My dad thinks it's probably a mouse. Now, I don't know what it is, but I know it's not a mouse. John now asks me why I won't sleep with him anymore. I say it's because I'm too old to sleep with him. The truth is, I'm too scared to spend the night in there. I know I can't tell mom or dad, but I don't know if I should tell John what happened to me, or if that will scare him even more. Harold Lada. He was like a, a Mr. Beast, always wanting to do crazy things. He was at the airport with his two cousins when he saw this machine that wrapped up suitcases. You know how items get shrink-wrapped? Well, this machine essentially shrink-wraps suitcases. Harold saw the machine and it gave him a funny idea. And he opened up his own suitcase. He told him he was going to hide inside of it and asked him to zip him up. Then, he wanted them to take him to the luggage wrapping machine and get him all taped up and have him checked in. Harold wanted to see how far through airport security he could get before he was caught. They thought it was a fun idea, so they went along with it. So Harold got into his suitcase, and luckily he was a small guy, and they zipped him up and wheeled him over to the shrink wrapping machine, paid the money, and had the case shrink wrapped. He had his phone with him, so they were able to check that he could still breathe, and he could. The cousins next went to the agent. They were flying from Los Angeles to New York, and they were super nervous and weighed the case. Of course, it was super heavy. And the agent looked at them strangely and asked what was inside the suitcase. The cousin said, some weightlifting equipment. And they thought they were going to get caught right then and there. But they were instead told they'd have to pay an excess luggage fee. And the suitcase, with Harry inside, was checked in. Now Harold was feeling a little cramped and sore. He expected at any moment for an alarm to go off. And that he'd have to explain to someone that it was just a practical joke. We all know this because he took out his camera and started recording. Suddenly, he felt a tremendous jolt as presumably the case crash-landed on a conveyor belt. He was spun upside down and became disoriented. His phone left his hand at this point and he lost access to it. The case rotated a few more times and Harold shouted out in hopes that a baggage handler could hear him. But it was drowned out by the roar of a plane engine. Interference interrupted the recording. His cousins didn't know what to do. They tried calling Harold, but he never answered. They thought about telling someone in security, but also figured they'd get in a lot of trouble. They were worried that Harold could freeze to death or something bad might happen. So they looked up on the internet about cargo areas. They knew passenger cabins were pressurized so people could breathe okay, and found out that cargo areas were too, which made sense as a lot of planes often carried pets and live animals for restaurant menus. So instead of alerting anyone, they got on the plane themselves and took it all the way to New York. They ran down to baggage claim waiting for the suitcase. When it came, they took out their video camera ready to film Harold, record everything for YouTube. They'd actually made a big thing of it, announcing to everyone waiting that their cousin had hidden a suitcase and made the flight. They wanted it to go viral, so other people started filming it too. And when the case finally came, they tore at the wrapping, which was hard to get off. Harold didn't move. They thought he was tricking them at first, but his face was white. The coroner later concluded that another object, presumably a heavy suitcase, had slowly pressed against his ribs and prevented his breathing. He died a very painful death, much like drowning, but in the air. Now, if you ever seek a thrill, don't hide in a suitcase, as it might turn into a coffin.
I'm a freshman now at Cal State. When I was a kid, I went camping with my mom and dad. We would go every weekend of the summer to Leo Creo State Park, which is a campground in Los Angeles, stones throw away from the beach. At night, they would put down a barrier so no more cars could come in, essentially locking you in from the outside world. So you felt safe. Us kids, we would wander around and do whatever we want. It was a lot of fun. But it also seemed like a revolving door as each weekend I'd meet new friends and I'd never see them again, which was kind of sad. One day in October, we went back there as a special treat. Mom and Dad went to the beach and I hung around the campground just walking around. I came across a girl hiding in a bush. It's kind of weird. Like I couldn't figure out what she was doing in there. And as I stared at her, she shooed me away with her hand. I turned, but it was, it was too late. I'd given away her hiding spot and someone found her. She was playing hide and seek. I didn't get her name, but she said I could join in if I wanted. Not to mention she was really nice and really cute. Soon, I was playing with them. About six kids and me. I ran and hid. Now I got a really good spot behind the store dumpster where I could see anyone coming. So I could actually move into a different position if they did. That way, I could always avoid being caught. I thought I was so clever. But after a while, I realized it wasn't fun just hiding on my own. I wanted to hang out with that girl find out her name. I figured it'd be more fun if I left where I was and came back here next game with her. We could hide here together or something, you know? So I stood up and I crept out, keeping close to the trees, but knowing at some point I'd get caught. A few minutes later, a catcher yelled, I see you! And I became a catcher too. By that time, everyone but the girl had been caught and transformed into catchers. We looked everywhere for her. At the beginning of the game, there were rules set up. Boundaries, a line that you couldn't cross. One of the guys was sure that she had crossed it. Someone else figured she'd gone back to her tent or something. No one actually knew her name or anything else about her. I'd seen one of those forensic shows on how police form lines to search for missing persons, so that's what I suggested. We formed a line and went searching, looking everywhere. But we couldn't find her. It was getting dark, and one by one, the kids were called back to their tents by their parents. Until it was just me left looking. I wandered around yelling, I can't find you! We give up! Come out! But she never came out. I spent a few hours with my flashlight, looking before my mom and dad came looking for me. I told them I was searching for my friend. They said she'd probably gone back to her tent but it just didn't sit right with me. So they took me to the front gates where there was a park officer on duty and he seemed to take it seriously. I went back to our tent and it began to rain. There was something soothing about the rain pitter and pattering on the canvas. Gradually it got fiercer and fiercer. I think it helped me to get to sleep. In the morning before we left, I took one more walk around the camp. Everyone seemed like normal. In my head, I imagined a mom screaming out the name of her lost daughter, but I never saw it. All I saw were campers being packed up and all their belongings being put in the car, people dumping trash and putting out campfires. We all got in our car and left. I dreamed about the girl for a while. It's what teenagers do. But then, I forgot about her until now. I was researching for a class I'm in at Leo Creo State Park is mentioned. Around the time I was there, a girl drowned in a storm drain, kind of like that movie It. She climbed down it and got trapped somehow and couldn't get out, and then it started raining. I'm looking at her photo right now, and it's the girl I was playing hide and seek with. I'm really upset right now because I feel I gave up looking for her when I was playing hide and seek with her. They never found her. She was hiding relying on someone to find her, to save her. And that find never came until it was too late. Which one was the scariest?
past and just remember don't turn 